So let's uh, let's look to uh, start the meeting. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this meeting uh, may be uh, videotaped and rebroadcast um, on WRPS or other outlets in the future. Uh, we'll start it with uh, the approval of the minutes uh, from our meeting of May 21st. Uh, do I have uh, any discussion? We got a motion. Motion. Uh, Second. So we've got a motion by uh, Jared, uh, second by Chris Bernica. Um, I will start off with uh, Chris. Yes. Julie. Yes. Alan. You're on mute, Alan. Oreo. Oh, mute. Yeah. Uh, Jared. Yes. Sorry for waking you up. Uh, Mark? Yes. Christine? Yes. Doug? Yes. Uh, I have to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, which one? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Doug Lapp? Um, yes. <laughs> and then Ashley? Yes. Tim? Yes. Dan? Yes. Jill? Yes. Doug Wallow? I'm abstaining. I, I had a work conflict last meeting. Oh, that's right. Uh, Gene? Yes. And uh, Danielle? Yes. All right. Um, minutes are approved. Uh, we're next to the next. And uh, we'll turn this over to, uh, uh, to Lorraine and Sean uh, to talk about the, uh, des the, the design discussions. Sure, thank you. Chris, can I share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. All right. Okay, make sure I still see everybody. And come on over here. I cannot, oh, there we go. All right, I could not tell if it was in presentation mode or not. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, with me tonight is Mariana uh, Antello, our architect, um, Mike Dowhan, and Mike DeBarry from 3SI, who's working on data communications. We have a couple of items we've been working um, feverishly on the design documents, moving them ahead and advancing them. At this point, it's a lot of coordination between our architects and engineers and civil team but also making sure that we're gathering the information um, that we may need from the administrators and the teachers before they leave. So I do appreciate Alan, your and Michelle's time assisting us closing out some of these open items as we move on. Um, tonight, we wanted to go over some updates that have occurred at the media center and administration specifically. At our last meeting, we discussed the color on the windows. Um, so Mariana has some new images to show to sort of um, give you a better sense of what that might look like. I, last meeting, we also talked about gates on around the access road. So Mike has some proposed locations as well as different style gates that he'll go through with you. The fence type at the front of the driveway will start to touch on the planting type and material. We're not expecting decisions tonight. There'll be a lot of information for you to see and then think about so we can continue that discussion. And then um, after a review of the DD set, some questions have come forth about uh, camera at the field. And we have some ideas about how to present that and um, manage that, get that information out there and um, provide accessibility. Because if we create a platform as part of the project, it needs to be accessible. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to move on and let Mariana take us through. Okay, so uh, on the first floor plan, we're going to discuss the administration updates as well as the guidance and a little bit of the nurse updates. You can go. Okay, so uh, what we did basically is adjust the spaces to better flow with the uh, building geometry, but still provide uh, workable spaces. On the admin uh, area, we uh, provide a little more visibility from the vestibule and from uh, this, the school towards that main space on the admin suite as you go in. 
Um, and then I don't know how much of the admin space you have seen before. We have two conference rooms. It's a conference room that can be two or it can be one. And this is because we have that uh, folding partition in the middle where Lorraine is pointing right now. Uh, then we have uh, three uh, smaller offices for the uh, assistant principals and one that is a spare office at the moment. There is a station for a secretary uh, right across uh, from the principal's office, which is the larger office. And then uh, the main improvement I would say on this area was what we did with the male uh, room. Uh, right now it's more of a regular shape and we have all the male slopes required incorporated. They are mounted on top of a top and some cabinets underneath. So we have plenty of storage there. And there's a printed shown on that area. And we communicate this way There's to the nurse suite where we already just arranged the way the walls are to better work with exterior geometry and provide nicer space for the uh, uh, resting area and and the receiving area the the waiting area on the office and we provided a, a small area where a desk can be for the nurse and she can have a whole view of the suite from that point but also has a private office uh if there's any kind of you know uh, phone conversations or private conversations that need to happen but she still has uh, the ability to look into the suite through the side lights we provided. On the opposite side of the vestibule, we rearranged the way we access the SRO office. Uh, that way, right now, it's accessed from the main school, from the corridor. But it does have uh, uh, windows that allow uh, that, that person to see uh, into the vestibules as well as into the area right outside the entrance. Um, then on the guidance suite, uh, we created a small waiting area. We have a conference uh, room as it was requested. We have some storage on both ends of the corridor. And then we provided uh, the offices for the adjustment counselors, the psychologists, and the behaviorists. Uh, what we did on this area was also we switched the location of the electric room so that it's towards the elevator and all the guidance uh, offices are located more towards the left. That is, the, those are the changes on, the, on this uh, floor. I don't know if there's any comments or questions. No? Okay, Lorraine. You Oh. Sorry, I have a quick question on the, um, we can't really tell where I'm pointing, but if we're looking at the building, that first uh, space to the left, is there, there, so there's a window looking into the vestibules? Yeah, here. That, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Is yep. that class, um, going to have the, any type of bulletproofing on it or? Not, not this glass, but this glass here has the 3M film. Okay. Is there any chance we could maybe add that on that side, just in the event someone tried to exploit that weakness, for lack of a better term? We can we can look at that. I'm just trying to. Um, I just wonder how far down you chase it, but yeah, we can look at that window. Maybe just that, because again, you know, I mean, if the SRO has one on the other side, uh, what's to stop them from potentially? exposing it on the other side. You know what I'm saying? One side, yeah. that side doesn't. Thank you. Let me just make a note. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? All right. I'll keep going, Mariana. It should okay. change. One second. There we go. Oh. Okay, on the second floor plan, the main changes were done on the media center. Basically, and I'm going to explain this here because in the next slide I rotated the image. Uh, basically, what we did, Lorraine, if you can point to where yep. the reading and yep. the lower portion, we, we, no, on the south, 
No, 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 the south. Okay, we basically what we did is we moved all the block of rooms, smaller rooms that are located at the south of the media center down closer to the pods and that way we created a larger space and more regular space for the media center itself. Now you can move to the next one. Okay. And again, this is rotated, so it might be, but it just read better on this slide. So we move those rooms as I, uh, that are to the left now, farther to the left, and that way we created a, a more regular center area into the media center. You access the media center through the bottom right side. This is coming from the entrance and the stair. In the main corridor, we have the circulation desk right in front there, being able to control people getting in and out and at the same time controlling, being able to see the whole space of the library as all these uh, uh, display cases and, and bookshelves that you see here are low. So the visibility is open and you're aware to see the whole space. Um, the main space is, as I said, more regular right now. We have a main teaching area located at the top of the, of the view right now. The, 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 that's the, the teaching, lay, the seating layout. The teaching area, the teaching wall will be looking up. And against that, we have the, the, cafe, the cafetorium double height space. The walls are all filled pretty much with bookcases so that we could accommodate all the volume needs that the school said they have, you have. Uh, then we have the more, for, you know, we have the more formal teaching area and then we have working tables that are laid out around the room. And we have these very flexible uh, bookcases that are on casters so they can be, at, you know, we're showing a layout, but they can be adjusted as, the requirements of the functions that you're having there. And we have also the soft seating, which are the little circle ones. Uh, those are, again, easy to move around, kind of fun for the kids, colorful, and they can be rearranged depending on the activities that are going on on the media center. We have a couple display cases, and we have the window seats that are, so yeah, the windows with window seats on the on the on the south of this view, um, and then we created uh, on the top. Yeah, what Lorraine is pointing right now. It's a reading nook we created, which I think it's really fun and interesting. Uh, it gives a little more privacy, more intimate setting for for the kids to hop and read a book or magazine but at the same time it's, a, it's still a, li a little fun for the kids this age and it, and it is right next to the window and it connects to the main um, teaching wall through an opening that is like a portal you can go to the next one right and now we're going to the color options so the first option that we're showing you it's the blue option we heard you, so we incorporate the blue and all the trims around the windows, the, the, the window seats, and also the, the color scheme overall, it's a blue color scheme. And that, that will kind of carry through the two options. And uh, we kept the, those bookcases into a wood grain look, so to give it a little more warmth. And you can, Lorraine, if you can go to the next slide we show how that looks on the outside. So you can see some of that blue bleeding into the courtyard space. And then the next option that we have is where we incorporate more color into it. And again, because we heard you and we heard that you want the blue, we added more blue to that option that has the more colors into it. Um, and you know, that's, basically the study and then the next slide will show how that reads on the outside and we would really like to hear what what your thoughts are on these two options if there's a preference or if there's any kind of variation you want us to consider
personally, I like the multiple colors. Okay. Yeah. I, like I think color. it adds a, at this age group, um, it just adds a little bit more fun to it. Yeah, there's like a whimsical element to it and it, it doesn't appear as dark either. Like there's a, a brightness that comes through as well. I think the multicolor looks less formal to yeah. me. I love the blue. I'm glad that you added the blue into the second option, but I think when it's all blue, it almost looks uniform rather than sort of, like you said, whimsical, sort of silly. Okay. So now we have a direction there. Good. Thank you. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. And this is just a view, a rendering. We're st still working on some of the things that uh, are still in play here. Um, I place this more of a transition for, for Michael to go on after. Um, we're still looking with working with civil and uh, in the, all the engineers in general and ourselves on how these plantings are going to go, you know, where these plantings are going to be, how tall they're going to be. But this gives you an idea of how this exterior learning environment feels uh, at the moment. And to the left, you can see those two bay windows, I'm going to call them, that are shown clad in, in green right now. And these are something that we're working right now on figuring out how to engineer in detail. And with that, I pass, if there's any, not any more comments for me, I'll pass the torch to Mike. Thank can you. I, can I ask one question? Yes. Um, this is gonna seem kind of weird. I'll explain why in a minute, but can you just tell me the, the window sills, are those concrete? Is that wood? Like what material is it and how is it? fabricated or okay what part of the seal are you referring to the, exterior like that, 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 the, the outside you know the bottom of the, the bottom yeah, yeah that is a precast seal it's precast concrete precast concrete and, yes and how, how and the reason why i'm asking is because in my last town uh, we had an issue where years after the high school addition was built the the slabs of concrete literally fell out from the second story and they weren't installed correctly. I think there were supposed to be pins or something that helped. They are supposed in. to be pinned. Yeah, and so they weren't installed. And so we ended up having to spend a ton of money to take them all out, and we just we put in wood basically. Just um, so I was just wondering, just what the design was, and uh, I know it sounds stupid, but I just thought I'd ask, and if if there was other, if we, I'll leave it at that. I was just curious. Yeah, no, there there's some uh, stone anchor pins that will hold those pre-cut pieces back to the structure. Um, that is our typical detail. And right now we're looking into them to figure out the, the designer wanted this very thin look. And we're looking into that to see, you know, what is the right thickness for them to be able to properly anchor them. Yeah, I don't think we'd recommend, and, no, and just so you no question is stupid, Doug, because everyone has lessons learned, so it is always important to have them and not like two, 10 years from now say, I wish I had said something. So please don't never, never be afraid to ask a question. Thank you. I think wood on the outside is a, is more of a maintenance issue. It was probably at the time it was an easier fix for you guys in your solution. But I think, you know, precast is going to last longer. It's going to last as long as the bricks. So I think, you know, we would propose that because it's more rugged, but we do anchor them in. Any other questions? All right, Mike Dowhan, you're up. Great, thanks, Lauren. So I, just one second, Lauren, just off agenda for one second to let everybody on the, on the committee know, the main entrance sign out by Taunton Avenue that you're going to see when you come in, the, the finish of that sign uh, is right there. Thank you, Lauren. The, the finish of that sign is gonna be brick that matches the building, and the cap on that sign is gonna be the same material as the sill that we were just talking about a moment ago. So we'll, we'll, we're gonna tie the sign right into the building as well. So the first item that we'll talk about for the site is the access road gates. You can see we've identified two locations here. Location one's pretty straightforward for the gate. Location two required a little more thought. Um, it, it landed there where you see it because we need to be able to main, 
uh, maintain the ability for delivery trucks to come in, yeah, thank you, uh, access the site and then back up to the loading dock. So that's why that location two gate needs to be there. If we wanted to move it anywhere further north, uh, we, would, it would, we would need to be able to have the ability to lock and unlock that gate every time a delivery truck comes. Leaving it in location two is, you know, you lock it in the morning, uh, after the buses are gone, and then you don't have to touch it again until the afternoon when the buses come back. So those are the two locations we're looking at for the gates right now. In terms of the material for the gates, uh, we pulled together a few options. Um, you know, st starting at really simple cost-effective options, you know, steel gates, double leaf gates. You can see the one on the left is really simple. The one on the right is a little more, um, uh, you know, a little more, uh, the design's a little more matured. Um, let me just keep going right yeah thanks um, chain link cantilevered or roller uh, we don't have we, we don't have a lot of chain link on the site uh, I don't believe that either of them need to be rollers but I wanted to show them to everybody just in case someone had a strong preference for a roller instead of a swing gate go ahead Lori um, something a little more uh, ornamental it would be something like a steel pick on the left or the steel mesh on the right. I want, I want to just draw your attention to the steel mesh one on the right here for a second and sort of keep that one in the back of your head because that may tie into the next element of this presentation too. Uh, go ahead, Lorraine. And then of course there's, uh, you know, simple rustic looking wood timber, either a single or double swing. So those, those are the sort of gates that we could use at, at these locations. Um, maybe now's a good time to stop and see if anybody has any questions about their location or the material choices. I imagine the wood is cheap, but it probably doesn't have longevity, right? Like you're that, probably- That's correct. Stuff. That's correct. That's correct. There, there would always be a, a maintenance issue with the, with the wood ones though. Well, I'll chime in if you want. We have one of each at the high school right now, sliding gate and yep. swinging gate. And the swinging gate gives us trouble. Okay. And the sliding gate works well. Partly the swinging gate wasn't really installed the greatest, so that's part of it. Um, so it, again, those two things being said, I mean, they both work. They both work. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying we have that one right there. You have a picture up right now, that black gate. This we, one. Have, we have a style like that's similar to that. Yeah. With the rollers, Mike, yep. Mark? It, okay. Yes, it, wor it works well. I, have, I mean, it really work, works really well. Um, Again, I'm not trying to push anything. Uh, and we have the other style, kind of like um, the one you had with the silver, the very first frame. Yeah, yeah I just got to get back one. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That, we have it like the one on the left. Um, it's all black. Uh, it's on the stadium side and it swings like that. And it, again, it it's gives us a little problem, but then again, it was more of an installation thing. Yeah. I think if it was installed a little better, we'd have better luck with it. So. Is it a double leaf like this, or is it a single leaf where the whole thing is? It's, it's a double, it, therefore it has to line up in the middle with the slide to pin down in the middle of the road. If that's out of line, obviously it's a nuisance. You know, the sliding one just goes back and forth on the track consistently. Yeah, so the only issue with the sliding one, right, is that you need the space to slide yes, it open. Yes, yes, I, I agree. agree. And right. that, and that, there's that could be a problem. There. Yeah, yeah there's some I, slope there, right? Yeah. Again, uh, I think if the swing gate, I'm not, again, I'm not favoring either one. I'm just telling you, we do have one of each. It's ironic. And uh, again, if the swing gate was installed probably better correctly, it would work a little better. Mark's comments makes good sense, I think, on functionality. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on the functionality, but the, just as far as the materials and sort of the look. I, I really like the black, too. The, the What's up there now looks really clean. It sort of fits with the building. I like both that black material and the other black material. Um, the look of the swinging gate or the swinging silver or the other swinging silver looks when they see them next to each other it does look a lot different doesn't it and mm -hmm. I, I i don't know that's just my eye my wife will tell you that i don't have the best stylist eye but i just think it looks clean it looks like it matches the rest of the building the wood to me looks a little bit out of place um and i guess just not a big fan of the, of the plain yeah material. wood would definitely not be a choice i would think i, I don't would know how definitely would not. just not not durable enough for us obviously if the one on the left was black, Daniel, it might be better too. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so here's the part where I tell you guys that all of the site furnishings, light poles, fences, and everything on the site we're proposing is grays and silvers, not blacks. 
<laughs> because it because it's a much more neutral color that kind of disappears in the landscape. We very rarely use black, but it, uh, again, open open to discussion. You'll see some more stuff in a few minutes too. That and you'll see the the. Uh, and I say that the one on the left looks like less like a prison or uh, more like yeah. right. Yeah, I get more yeah. friendly, and I'll, I'm, then you could pick a color later. The one on the right looks too, I don't know, obtrusive, you know, too. It's, yeah, it's it's a little heavy, right? It's hard to yeah, find. Yeah, too heavy, right? right. It's exactly. It's, Good it's a little heavy. It's a little heavy-handed. Yep. Okay, so oh, can beautiful. I ask? If, sorry, go ahead, Doug. No, that wasn't Doug. Question. That was yep. My concern uh, is on the roller. If we did go that route, uh, particularly on location two, do we even have the space to even consider that? Uh, the roller at section look. The roller at both locations is going to be difficult. To yeah. be honest, the, the roller. They're not very good looking too, either. They're not great looking. No, I know. I, I, but I, I I'm, agree. I'm just thinking it's a. It's going to be a, a logistical, yeah. difficulty even yeah. doing that. It has even. to go here. Yeah, Lorraine's showing it right. It would have to slide to towards the number two on this on this. Yeah. Picture. Slide the opposite way because that's where the playground is. But I think they're kind of moves us more to that swinging gate because I think logistically we're going to struggle with with any type of a sliding gate. I agree. Agreed. We wanted to make sure you sh we showed you all the options though in case there was a really strong consensus for something sliding and we'd have to make some adjustments to the site. You know, the only concern I have on swinging gates and to Mark's uh, point, it always seems over time um, whether it's an installation issue or whether it's a settling issue, yeah. but anytime you have a swinging gate and you go down the road five, 10 years, 15 years, you know, what was nice and lined up yeah. due to settling or whatever, you start to have problems, whether it starts to separate or whether it, you know, settles a different way that they don't match up. Um, so that's my only concern. Yeah. So a lot of that, um, uh, a, a lot of that has to do with the soil conditions where, where they set the footings for these things and the depth of the footings. So if, if this is the direction you go and we'll, we'll make sure that we take a really close look at the soil conditions there and, and maybe what we do is we, we, we do a different job with compaction. We fill it with, with stone instead and, and pour like that and, and get a little deeper depth for the footing too so that it, it has to do with the soil, right? Because you're right. I see this all the time. They they start they start the the weight of them starts pulling them down towards the middle, right? And a lot, like I said, a lot of it has to do with soil conditions. So if we address the soil conditions up front, then there's less of a chance of something like that happening five, ten years down the road. Okay. I think the, I think the footing is more important than the soil, but again, we well, yeah, 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 whatever you design. And then, and then someone has to make sure they do it, and then we'll be good. Yep. Okay. So again, keep that steel mesh one in, in, in mind, though, too, for this next piece. So for the fences, so the next, the next item is uh, everybody wanted to see what the fencing and that sort of whole entrance sequence at the front of the building is going to look like. So we're using two different materials at the front. Um, uh, in, in lieu of the, the typical, um, you know, Marisar sort of... Um, uh, ornamental metal fence that you see everywhere uh, or in lieu of chain link which we really don't want to do in front of the building we're proposing this um, this fence panel system uh, by Omega uh, it's steel uh, it's got a really nice look to it you can you can see it's got a, it's got a lot of um, open and airiness to it uh, and it's really kind of an elegant kind of piece and we're proposing that for the for the majority of the fence area and then if you can go on to the next one, Lorraine, and then at the, and you'll, you'll see this all in a composition in a moment, at the, um, as, you tra as you transition to the uh, entrance plaza, we want to transition from that type of uh, picket fence that we just showed to more, to some laser cut panels that are framed. Um, don't, don't be alarmed by the designs, the different designs here. Um, I showed this to, to let you know that the, the nice thing about these metal panels is they can be laser cut literally to anything we want. They can be customized. So what we're thinking about right now is, thank you, Lauren. What we're thinking about right now is looking at some of the uh, environmental graphics that our graphics team is doing for the, uh, for the corridors inside the building. 
once those graphics are sort of settled on and finalized, uh, our current plan is to create sort of silhouettes of those graphics and then have them laser cut into these into these panels so that you get a little connection to the not just connection to the building, but a little bit of a preview of what's going to happen in the building. And you can see here, hopefully, in this perspective that. The, that omega fence sort of runs behind the plant material as you get to, as you walk towards the entrance plaza, so that you're walking along the sidewalk in this plant material there. As you get to the entrance plaza, it transitions so that the, the perforated metal panel is now uh, at the at the back of the sidewalk instead of the plantings. And then that what that does is that kind of creates a space. It frames the space. It frames the entrance plaza and sort of lets you know that that's your arrival sequence. And again, I, I just want to reiterate. You know, we're, we're just showing a pattern on these on these panels. It wouldn't look like this. It would be something completely customized to what we want. Um, and that's sort of the transition and entrance sequence that we're creating for the exterior of the site. The reason why I had mentioned about the uh, the the gates before the uh, the swing gates before is that that omega metal panel, the the, the fencing panel. I think we could, if we wanted to, we could make that into um, into a, a double a double gate for the for the two gate locations and then that material would also match the fence material that we're using here and in the back of the school too someone Mike, have a question question for me obviously is what are, what are we looking at for a premium um to go with laser cut versus you know standard fencing yeah it, it's 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 more i don't i don't have an exact number but i can get that for you um rich it's not I mean, that it's more like we're, we're 10, trying to be very judicious more. with it what's okay. that i said are you talking like 10 20 percent more per panel or are you talking uh, like three times the cost no 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 i'd say i'd say 20 percent. i was going to say 20 percent more we're using it at another project at providence college and okay. it's it, it's more expensive but yeah. It's it's a very 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 common um, material. It's just that it doesn't get used a lot in this situation. So that's why we thought it would be an interesting way to really create a nice sense of place for you folks. Uh, you know, you and I think it's very limited. You know, we're using it in a very limited amount, but really to help frame that entrance. Right. Exactly. And and we may have uh, two or four panels in the back at the entrance to the south playground too to mark the entrance to that playground too. But all the rest of it, uh, we're, we're planning on all the other fencing. We're planning on using the uh, the Omega fence that I showed you before the uh, the panels. It's just then, it's strictly an accent. And right now, in the plans, you're looking at either silver or gray versus the the black. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can kind of see. Uh, hopefully, you can see in this rendering, the light columns that run along the front of the building. Those are all silver. The 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 flagpole, of course, is spun aluminum, so that's silver. The LED lights are going to be silver. We're proposing to use a, a silver gray for the uh, for the Omega panel, and I'm hoping to use a silver gray for that too. It it really does a nice job of disappearing in the landscape using silver versus black that I've I found over the over the years. You know, um, most of the schools that we that we work on now, we we try to make all of the exterior furnishings uh, in the silver and gray uh, color family. Um, it just makes them fall back into the background a lot more than than if they're black. The other thing about them is you notice the dirt more on black than you do on silver. Absolutely. So over time with rain and everything else, you do it does stand out a lot more on black surfaces than it yep. does on silver. Yep. You can see it kind of ties neatly into the into the building panel, some of the building panels too, as opposed to black. You know, if you picture those all those elements in black instead of silver. There'd be a lot more contrast here. Instead, your your eye kind of focuses more on the building this way, and the, those um, you know those vertical elements sort of blend into the background more. I love the laser cut. I think it looks beautiful. Great. That Omega fence is awesome looking. I think for okay. a fence. Good. Yeah. And look, it looks strong too. The way I could tell the way it's put together. I think it is. And it's, it, like, it's steel. It's steel. It's not aluminum. It's steel. Yeah, real sharp. For the color, I like the color too on the gray. For any of you who drive black cars this time of year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Michael, what's I was the, the same thing. I really like those laser panels, and I think that if you're 
people are like the colors um, of the windows because of that like whimsical look, yeah. then those uh, laser panels really um, follow suit with that if that's the look you're going, whereas the black or something um, more plain, whereas the plain blue windows is a more traditional look. So if you're looking for like more whimsical, playful, then I think that the laser cut panels and the colored windows, like that all sort of ties in together. Great, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I, and I think, you know, what once, like I said, once we have those um, corridor graphics finalized inside and we can sort of create silhouettes of what those corridor graphics are gonna look like uh, and, and then get them the actual design onto here so that you can see the update, um, I think you're gonna be really happy with it too. What's the finish on those? Is it uh, galvanized? It, it can be a, it can be aluminum. It, be, it can be galvanized. It can be a lot of different things. They they can cut these panels out of almost any metal material that we want. And there's there's a good five or six different manufacturers of them, Sean. So we don't have to worry about finding equals. I just think for Mark, I should start thinking about what finish you want. I mean, we've done powder coated, we've done galvanized, we've done all sorts of different stuff and different towns have different opinions on what they want and what holds up best. So uh, just something to think about, Mark. Since they're gonna be away from cars too, Sean, aluminum might not be a bad way to go here because it's really durable. We don't have to worry about corrosion and stuff like that, you know, because there may be some salt, you know, we really don't want to use salt when we, when we, you know, when we salt the roads, we really don't want to use salt, but it, uh, you know, bottom line is that sometimes it ends up getting used so. it's going to happen yeah it's going to happen exactly right okay um, um how sharp are the edges on that cutout yeah so they have frames around them julie they're not they're not just the panels themselves every every each individual panel which is can be anywhere from four to six feet wide each one of them has an individual frame around it you know what I mean? So they're, so they're not sharp at all. You don't, you, don't, you don't touch the actual edge of those things. They're very thin. The panels themselves are very thin and then they sit in a frame. Yeah, I'm just thinking of little kids putting their hands through there. Uh, understood, understood. Mm -hmm. Yep, understood. Hey, wanna keep us going here, Mike? Yeah, please. Uh, planting design. So I'll, 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 I'll try to speed it up here. So the, um, the overall site concept. So when we, when we, when we, when we're creating planting designs, we, we look at this, you know, in terms of creating a canopy and creating shade and structure for the site. We also use plant material um, as an architectural element to frame spaces, to highlight spaces. Um, and and, and, and create uh, and force and create views. Uh, so you can see through here, like all the, the greens, everything in the green shades are sort of large deciduous canopy trees, you know, the, and then you can see the, the, the more purple ones are sort of medium sized trees. The blue ones are multi-stem trees and the ones in the reds and pinks, especially in the oranges, especially towards the front are sort of more upright architectural type species. Uh, so that, so I'm going to start with the front of the building. Can you go to the next slide, please, Lorraine? Uh, the, the, the trees on the left that you see, the, uh, the Slender Silhouette Sweet Gum and the Princeton Century Ginkgo, those are the trees that we're proposing for the front entrance. The, the Sweet Gums are the ones that are going to be right up along this, uh, the side of the building. You can see what their growth habit is like. So they grow in really tight spaces, and that's what we, we have there. So, uh, but we want to be able to get some green in front of the building and create that transition. So those are perfect trees for that small space that are going to grow straight up right against the building. The ginkgos that you see the, with the really nice yellow fall color, those are going to sit in that median that we just looked at where the, um, where the fencing is. And those green pillar pin oaks, we're using those around the perimeter of the building in select locations um, where we want to get some green up against the building, but we don't have a lot of space. Multi-stem trees are all, again, all of these, or the vast majority of these are either native to Northeast US or they're adapted to Northeast US. You know, all the, the usual suspects, serviceberry, um, white birch, uh, redbud, and uh, that's all sort of understory stuff that's gonna, that's gonna create the understory canopy effect. Go ahead. There you go, the red, 
the, the proven winners, we like to call them, stuff that I know will grow in tough urban environments and gives us a lot of neat fall color. You can see the red maple in the fall color, a, a different variety of ginkgo that has a more spreading habit. Tulip tree, a different a variety of sweet gum, again, that has a more pyramidal habit. And, and you know, London plane tree, which is uh, the most, probably the most durable city tree that there is, uh, aside from maybe the ginkgo. And then, you know, we've got the medium sized trees like tupelos and conservas and stewardias. All of them have a really nice variety of shape, form, and fall color. Question for everybody, is, this, is are deer a problem in, in this part of the woods in Rockland? Pardon me, this is not really. I, I will say I did see a deer on the rail trail on one of my bike rides the other day right by there. Yes, I'm on Lee Street. That? We, we do we have, have deer, deer, but they're not a problem. Okay. We have deer, but it's not a problem. Yeah. They eat all the abavite on my... In That's, my why right. That's why I asked. That's why I asked. Yeah, so if, if deer are a problem, we're using abavite to, to screen the... Um, to screen the, the the transformer and the generator and the and the loading dock and everything like that, because it's an easy plant to plant. It grows. It's durable. It grows straight up. It shoots up like a rocket, and it creates a nice instant mature effect. If the deer are a real problem, then we're gonna have to switch probably to eastern red cedar. Um, again, great plant. Deer hate them. They're bitter, bitter. Deer hate them, but they take a lot longer to grow and they spread more. So we have to plant them. So we have to space them all when we plant. So there's 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 going to be some space in between them when they're when they're small and first first installed. So if we go with arborvitae, you get the full effect right away. But you know you may have to we may have to concern ourselves with deer. If we go with the red cedar, you're going to see some space in between. It's going to take some time for them to grow in and fill in. Okay, Larry. Understory stuff, I think I may have mentioned to the, to the crowd before that over time, especially since we have no uh, irrigation on these sites, over time we've sort of conformed our plant palette to materials that we know can, will grow once established only with the amount of annual rainfall we get here in, in Massachusetts. So it's really, we really have um, narrowed our plant palette down to ornamental grasses and perennials. And you can see a couple images of the types of plants that we use. And we try to use different stuff that blooms at different times. Grasses, there's, there's two types of ornamental grasses. There's uh, what's called cold weather grasses and warm weather grasses. The only difference is cold weather grasses start to bloom and sprout really early in the spring. Warm weather grasses sprout later in the spring, but last right through the fall. And you can see those two images of little blue stem for the summer and the fall. Those are those are warm season grasses, but they're fantastic through the winter. That, that fall image you see right there, they stay like that right through the winter, right through December and January into February. Those, that's the plant that we're thinking of using um, along the entirety of the front entrance, al along the base of the front entrance where those slender silhouette sweet gums will be planted, because that's the color look that we're, that we're looking for. And the feather reed grass, the miscanthus, the switchgrass, we're going to plant those in large swaths elsewhere throughout the site. And we always um, drop in some perennials for some uh, four season color to seed them, black eye susan, stuff like that. Go ahead, Lauren. And then finally, the bioretention areas. We want to give you guys a, a feel of what the, those bioretention areas, once they become mature, all the plant material inside, there's three bioretention areas, right? That's, this is basically what most bioretention areas look like. They've got some flower in them, they've got some color in them seasonal color, a lot of seasonal interest. Um, I wanted you to make sure you saw these that, to know what they look like because there's one of these at the main entrance and that's where we have that boardwalk crossing over one of these with an interpretive sign panel um, for the students to, to understand um, the, you know, the way bioretention works. So as you, as, if you're a walker at this new school, when you come down Taunton, you're gonna have to cross a boardwalk that, that goes over one of these bioretention areas in order to walk to the front entrance of the building. So you'll be crossing over one of these every time you walk into the school. And then last, uh, the last item we have for the site agenda is the camera platform. Um, Lorraine mentioned earlier that there was a request for 
possibly trying to find a place to put a camera at, at the field. Um, you can see on the, the image on the left, we've identified three uh, locations. They're all, they're all relatively at the same elevation. Um, the, the, the ask was for trying to get it 10 feet in the air. You see the section we drew here on the right. Um, if you, you know, between the, um, the, the grade change for the terrace seating, by the time you get to the top of the terrace, plus the height of the camera, we're about nine and a half feet off of the, off of the elevation of the synthetic turf field. So we're, we're trying to look at ways to avoid having to build any kind of platform, because as Lorraine said, there's, there's gonna be an issue of accessibility. So for every foot we raise a platform in the air, we need 12 feet of ramp, right? Um, so that creates, that takes up space that costs money. So if there's a way to set up the recording station at one of those three locations that's suitable for, for everybody, the only thing we'll really need is a, is a concrete pad and then our uh, electrical engineer will, will run the feed, whatever feed we need necessary to it. And we can, put a, we can put a recessed box in the ground, not something above ground that could get kicked or tripped over or whatever. We can put a recessed box in the ground that they can just open up and access the, whatever they need for the feed. So that was one of the options for cameraing out here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay away from the technical issues of this because I don't know about it. I'm going to pass it along to Mike Dabari right now. And he's going to talk about the second option for a camera for the field. Yeah, the, the second option would be to have a, what's called a sports camera. It's an unmanned camera. It's stationary. It can be put up on a pole. Uh, it would feed the video signal to uh, probably the uh, the high school uh, control room. Um, so that would avoid having to put any kind of platform up. It's also an unmanned camera. It would be high enough so that it would be out of harm's way uh, from vandalism. All right, it's a fairly inexpensive uh, solution. It's a question of whether or not you want uh, a live feed or if you're videotaping and uh, don't necessarily need a live feed. Thank you, Mike. I think we have, we have a history. Um, a, a real history of using students to videotape athletic events through yep. the cable studio and through coursework that's done at the high school. So just to throw that into the equation. All right, so what do they do? They take a field camera, a camcorder out, record, uh, saving the, uh, the video to the camera itself, and then go back for uh, the TV studio for editing? That's correct, Mike. Okay. Just to throw this out there, during this brave new COVID world, um, a live feed may be a good idea um, where, you know, th there's limits in crowds and gatherings for sporting events going down the road in the future. Um, you know, that if a parent can't be there because there's limits on how many people can be at a gathering, they might be able to, you know, access whatever events and programming are going on down there, you know, in another way. Explain how this camera works. It's, uh, it's basically two lenses that are 180 degrees apart. Uh, what you're sh uh, looking at there is a four lens camera, which is an older model. The newer model is two lens. But what it does is it actually follows uh, movement on the field. It's covering the whole field, but it uh, zeroes in on the, uh, the actual action. And then there's a computer that it feeds the video into that stitches the, uh, the two um, views from the two lenses together. So that's, you know, uh, the reason why it can be unmanned. It's not someone sitting there with a the joystick trying to follow the action. So just a couple of logistics questions related to this. Um, it does need a head-end computer, which we imagine would be at the high school, not at uh, the new elementary school. Um, there is a cost. It's upwards of ten thousand. I would say all in, all in, it's probably between ten and fifteen thousand dollars for the camera. It's not something we originally had in the budget, um, so we it, uh, we would want to know whether or not this is a direction you want to go in um, for the pricing set for the for the sixty percent CDs. 
I can chime in a little because I was part of it along with Chris Benica and Dave Cable Murphy. Um, and I know Chris is on right now. Um, so Chris, I know you have a real feel for this. Uh, can I just say that a platform, a concrete pad with a, with a, um, with conduits running to it is not a major, um, price. Nope. So I, I would, I would think, uh, Chris, please chime in that you would think you'd at least would like to have a platform. You'd have the option of, of shooting from the ground with a student. And you can have conduits that run to the poles for speakers. I think we talked about, and uh, and, a, and a plug uh, that was mentioned for a camera. What do you think, Chris? Correct. As long as we have a platform and a way to, if we run it through fiber to get it back to the station up here at the high school, in case we wanted to go live, that would be great. Um, also, with the portable camera there, with no one running it, just to let people know, we do have one. In the high school gym uh, this past winter we did go live with a lot of our basketball games um, to the WRPS YouTube page so that's an option too I mean it's a the video industry is changing every day again with COVID-19 that's changing too so we're trying to give parents you know live feeds if they can't come to athletics and meetings and stuff like that so but the platform would work out as long as we can get it back to the station through fiber somehow. So the fiber connection at the platform would go back through the Jefferson, the new Jefferson school, correct, Mike DeBerry? And the, and the new school is connected back to the high school? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, in the site coordination meeting, we talked about we have to bring uh, fiber to the existing Memorial Park School. Uh, the Memorial Park School is going to be coming down and the field is going to be built uh, at that location so we could leave the fiber. Oh, we could just reuse that. Yep, I yep. see what you're saying. Couldn't, yep. we take, couldn't we take the fiber from the stadium? Somehow there is fiber in the stadium press box, if you guys don't know. No, we do. We do. But we're actually intercepting a set that we're not intercepting that line, Chris. We're intercepting the line that currently goes to Memorial Park because we're going to be cutting it because our new foundations are going to go right through it. So we have to temporarily route around. And what Mike is suggesting is then we, you know, we route it in a way that we can use that again in the future. Exactly. So we just need fiber and power, which is not a problem to get out there. Correct. Um, we didn't have a sound system on the field originally. So that's something we'll need to add. Hey, Chris. Um, I think you and Dave said that even if you, you might do the speakers and later or just run conduits or some spring poles to the poles. Was that your conversation? As long as we have a setup where we could go down with two JBL speakers and set them up and that stuff, I believe that's what Dave had talked about. Yeah, we have site lighting poles there that you can run conduit to. I think that was a planned day when Chris was talking about it, you know, at the very least, because we know it's not very expensive to be able to do that. Okay. We just wanted to give everyone, if in case someone needed a sound system, they could, you know, we could have one. That's all. Yep. Just if we, if we build it in, then we have controllers. Where do you put the controllers? They're moisture sensitive. So now all of a sudden we're putting, you know, trying to figure out where they are so you can access them. So that's all we're thinking about. But just bring them down so you can hook up some speakers to them. That's not a big deal. If I could back up for a second, Chris, you had mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, you said, as long as I have a platform, I'm good. Where we're showing the recording station in this section at nine and a half feet above there, would you consider that your platform? Yeah, that, that could work. As long as I get a clear view of the field, that's fine. Or anyone okay. who's going to record there. Yeah. I would assume youth football at some point would record their games. Okay. Put some map varieties around it, you know, <laughs> some grasses. <laughs> A needle. So, uh, you know, obviously what we're trying to do to, 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 to escape additional costs and to, to, and to escape the, uh, the, uh, the issue of having to build this up even more and get access to it is if, if this is okay, then you're right, Mark, all, all this is is a, it's, it's, it's a concrete slab on the ground and, you know, conduit running to it. And 
and a place to plug in, and that's it. That's the whole added cost. Right, and inexpensive and and yep. e semi easy. That's what yeah. we're looking yeah, for. I think I think that's the way to go. Yep. Yep. Okay. And you guys just tell us whether you want it in location one, two, or three. Doesn't make okay. any difference. Yeah, that'd be Chris. Chris and Dave would make that decision. Yep. Any sense, Chris? Um, when do you guys need to know by? Middle of next week, end of next week. Um, uh, let me just, let me meet with Dave. I yeah. can talk to him tomorrow and we'll go through this if I can get the PowerPoint. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That is all we had for you tonight. Excellent. Uh, any questions by anyone? Um, I'd like to add, I've been talking to our, our athletic director and um, uh, Brenda Folsom. I'm not sure her title, Alan, you might know better than me. But anyways, we, have, we were going over gym equipment. No one really spoke to him. Um, not, not a major deal, but um, everything looks great. They asked me about um, the basketball court. Now that's a, 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 a what would be the term, a legal size or a playable size, M-I-A-A, -A, what's the term? Does that make sense, uh, Lorraine? Yeah, um, Mariana, is it 84 by 50 or do we have a 90 by, it's an 84 by 50, correct? Uh, I thought Our we court. were doing 90. Mariana, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, yes, that's correct. It's the 84 by 50. We cannot accommodate the full size MIWA court size on the gym that the MSBA, on the dimensions, the, the space the MSBA allows us to have. Could you repeat that? It can, it's not, it's not MIAA, is that correct? Or MAII? It, 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 it is. It is MIAA. It's 84 it by 50. There are two sizes. Okay. So there's a smaller and a larger, and we are the smaller of the of two. Of the two. Okay, thank you. I'll let them know. It's not, yeah. but Do it. you couldn't play a high school game on that. You could. You can play a high school game on an 84 by 50. Okay. Yep, that is high school. Okay. Give a couple college, of is 50, so. college is 90. I'll let them know. There's a couple other questions, very simple. Sure. Um, I just want to mention here, it's very simple. You have the office and you have the storage area at the, on the west side of the gymnasium. And the, the middle, they, they were saying that they really would like to have the storage area possibly bigger than the office area. That, that would be just moving the Senate petition a few feet, um, you know, towards the office. Uh, I don't think that's a, a major change. But I'll send you the comments. Okay. And there was nothing major. I just wanted to mention uh, to you all that we did, I did contact, you know, our phys ed department and make sure that they're on board. So. We had met with them, Mark, so we've had a couple okay. of programming sessions with them. So maybe yeah. the individual you're talking to wasn't at that meeting, but we did maybe, that both yeah. in SD and DD. Yep. No, it looks great. It, it didn't look great. I read the specs. They were unbelievable. Mark, I know you had mentioned to me that, and I believe the cafeteria, there's a room where they have all the rack units, audio units, with a chair. That might be chia storage, is that correct? That got corrected, yeah. He got back to me on that. Lorraine can probably, yep. they put it around the corner next to the door, so it's not an issue. Yep. Okay, well, just wanted to make sure we weren't strung chias with audio uh, units. Nope. Yep, that was followed up. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you very much for the presentation. Next sure. on the agenda. Well, did anyone have a comment? Uh, next on the agenda is discussion of the school name. Uh, so there has been um, uh, some discussion uh, by a couple of members of the of the committee uh, for a potential uh, recommendation for a name of the new elementary school. And at this point, Dan, I'll I'll turn it over to you if you want. Sure. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> I appreciate it. I know, you know, ever since we all worked so hard together to get this vote passed and we got it passed and we're so excited about the future of our kids going into this school, um, you know, there's a whole lot of things we think about. And I know immediately and prematurely, we thought about the name and what it might be someday. And people speculate about all kinds of things, but um, why now? Why, am I, why do we bring this up now? Um, I think for a lot of reasons. Um, I've been thinking a lot 
about this recently uh, for a lot of reasons, personally. Um, everything going on in the world um, not being one of them. The craziness in the world, um, us being able to not gather, us being able to not see each other, um, us being able to not meet in person. Um, so I do have some thoughts about a name. Um, I don't think that we necessarily have to decide on specific wording of a name necessarily tonight. Um, but I do have some, I, I do have a lot of thoughts and I prepared something that's a little bit wordy. I hope you'll bear with me on it. Um, but the wordiness I think is deserved um, for the individuals that um, I'm re making remarks on. So um, here we go. What's in a name? As a boy of all the lessons that my father taught me, amongst the earliest and most frequent was to take pride and defend your family name, to make every effort through our deeds to make sure that others that bear it, our parents, our siblings, our children proud. What is in a name? Part of human nature is to give names to things, to people, and yes, to places and structures. Giving names to structures and buildings is often a way that we as a people pay tribute to lives lived, to service to others, and to inspire. What is in a name? We are on our path, we are on a path together as a community, as neighbors, to build a wonderful structure, a place where young minds will grow and be nurtured, a place where dreams will be born, a place where the foundations for our common futures will be built. What is in a name? How is a name given to a place of such importance? How is a name given to a place that will grow the minds of our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren? What is in a name? Who among us, or before us, has lived or is living a life so dedicated to others, so invested in the future of Rockland's children? Whom among us, or before us, is so worthy to have their names permanently affixed to this great structure? What is in a name? To you, my colleagues, I would like to submit to you the members of the Rockland Elementary School Building Committee. Just a summary of the commitments that Anne and Richard Phelps during their lifetimes have made to the town of Rockland and to its children. Anne Elizabeth Phelps. Anne was born on December 18, 1941. Our community was sad to say goodbye when our beloved Mrs. Phelps passed away on July 8, 2017. I would like to share with you just a small sample of Anne's commitment to enriching the lives of Rockland's youth. Anne was a member of the, the Rockland High School class of 1959. Anne was the Rockland High School nurse for more than 18 years caring for Rockland's children when they were hurting. Anne was the founder of Rockland's Holiday Magic, an organization dedicated to ensuring that Rockland children, whose families who have fallen on hard times, could provide gifts to their children on Christmas. Generations of Rockland kids have and will wake up on Christmas morning with full hearts experiencing the magic of the morning, thanks to Anne. Anne was the founder of the Senior Issues Program at Rockland High School. Anne was an active, active in and was a financial supporter of the Rockland Citizens Scholarship Foundation. Anne is a member of the Rockland High School Academic Hall of Fame. I would now like to share with you just a small sample of Mr. Richard Phelps' commitment to enriching the lives of Rockland's youth. Richard was a member of the graduating class of Rockland High School in 1958. Richard was a trustee of Rockland Public Library for three years. Mr. Phelps was a member of the Rockland Finance Committee for 10 years. Richard was a founding member of the Rockland Capital Planning Committee. Richard is a founding member of the Rockland Education Foundation, which has been able to give over a million dollars since its inception to enrich the educational opportunities of Rockland's children. Mr. Phelps was a vice chairman of the Rockland Middle and High School Building Committee. Richard was the vice chairman of the Rockland Senior Center Building Committee. Mr. Phelps is the chairman of the Rockland of the Elementary School Building Committee. Mr. Phelps served 26, 26 distinguished years serving on the Rockland School Committee, a position from which he recently retired due to health concerns. Mr. and Mrs. Phelps raised three wonderful and successful children. Jeffrey, Kimberly, and Rick are all distinguished graduates of Rockland High School who continue to give back to the community that they grew up in. There is not a person or persons that has given more of themselves to our town 
and to its children than Mr. Richard Phelps and his beloved late, late wife, Anne. There does not and has not existed a better example of service to community and to children than Anne and Richard Phelps. Personally, for me, Dick is an example, a mentor, and most valued to me, a friend. My time serving with him on Rockland School Committee made me a better volunteer and leader. My time admiring him has made me a better man and father. My time knowing him has made me increasingly more proud to call him my friend. Why now? Recent events in our world have painfully taught us that tomorrow is not guaranteed for any of us. The moment is now. Let us not regret an opportunity past. Let us show our friend Dick what he and his beloved late wife Anne mean to us. While specific wording of the new school's name can be made sometime in the future by more creative minds than mine, however, I do hope today that you will support my motion to name Rockland's newest educational environment in honor of Anne and Richard Phelps. Respectfully moved. Second. To Dan, uh, eloquently put, thank you. Um, we do have a motion. Um, I would like to open this up for uh, discussion, if possible, before a second, if anyone has anything to say um, on this topic. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Rich, I, I'll kick off. Um, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this, and I'll I share this story with you and Dan uh, in the talk last few Jared, days. Jared, you cut no. Uh, it's hard to hear you. Anecdotally speaking, and I'll share it with the rest of the group. It's a quick one. But, Jared, um, Jared, can you hear this? We, we can't I really hear you. Cut no. In uh, Rogers. Middle school. Yeah. I know How about now? No, it's 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 not any better. I'm sure it was very nice what you said, but I don't think any of us heard it. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Anyone else whose audio actually works? Uh, no. Let me try mine, uh, Rich. Rich. Um, I've been on multiple committees with Dick Phelps and have always been honored to even uh, sit at the same table with him. All right. How about now? Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you, Julie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Julie. Okay. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Dan said. Uh, it's been an honor to sit with Dick on uh, capital planning and uh, school building. And uh, just, just having him as a, a friend has been an honor. Uh, I agree with his nomination. I don't know that I could say anything better than Dan just said. I think that was so spot on, but I have nothing but great things to say about the Phelps. Amazing people, salt of the earth, um, really can't contribute anything more. So I, I wholeheartedly and fully endorse this. I think it would be a great testament to our community in a time when we're thinking and focusing about what buildings mean, as Dan said, and talking about monuments. These are two amazing people who've given so much, and I think it would mean so much for future generations of Rockland kids to see what it means to give back to your community um, with everything that you have and pay it forward. So I think this is a great idea. There's no one more deserving than Ian and Dick, and I agree um, that building should be named after those two for all they've done for the town of Rockland and Rockland Public Schools. When I first came to Rockland in 2012, I, um, <clears throat> I asked around who should I have on my site council as a high school principal, who should I have on my site council? And the first person that was mentioned was Dick Phelps. And I immediately contacted him and he immediately agreed to do it. He wasn't on the school committee at the time, 
And um, he's been, he's just been uh, an inspiration to me over the past eight years. So um, I, I can't say enough great things about Anne and Dick. They're both um, two of my favorite people in the entire world. So um, I, I wholeheartedly support Dan's motion. So oh, I've, uh, I've, I've got to know the, the Phelps family with Dick and Ann and, 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 and their three kids. Um, just an incredible family. Um, someone that you can admire uh, and you look up to um, what they've done, uh, not only individually, but, uh, but collectively. You, you don't find um, families that do that, uh, quite honestly. And uh, they have, for a long history, impacted this town. And uh, I, I believe going forward, the, the, the Phelps legacy will continue to impact this town in a positive way. My back or my soul? Try again. Can we hear you? Say something. Me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Uh, maybe not. You can hear me? No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Try calling in, Jared. Call in on the thing on your phone, and I bet you'll be okay. I'm I don't think I'm sick of Zoom meetings. Done. Ugh. I feel like this is a Saturday Night Live skit right now. I'm just saying. <laughs> And I can just say from my is, own experience. Can get my phone work. Can get work. I just wanted to add that me being new to town, it was amazing. You know, right when I started, Dick came in the town hall and introduced himself to me and gave me a little bit of background and made himself available. Just unbelievable gesture. I've gotten to know him a little bit over the last 10 months. And, you know, being new and what little I know, I don't want to say much, but I, uh, from my perspective, I completely support what you're all doing. Rich, maybe if we could um, mute Jared. Um, it's given a lot of feedback, I think, to everybody's. Yeah, know. so uh, there we go. So, who, uh, Chris, is that you who's got control of that? Uh, hold on now. Oh, it, all right. Jared's fine. Right. He's Jared's fine. There he is. you there now? Did you reconnect? Am I out? Hold on. Am I, Am I good? There you go. Yes. yes. Let me get out of the other thing. So, y'all that. Oh, feedback. Huh. I, all right. First, this there is my last Zoom meeting for anything. I'm done. <laughs> um, all right. So, sorry. Meeting's over. <laughs> I can still hear you all. I, I could still hear you. Let me change the background so it's a little more appropriate. But um, the, only, the only thing I, I wanted to, to just add, um, sorry for holding everyone up, but uh, back when I was in the Rogers Elementary School, I'll, I'll never forget a, a, a really small sort of day. Everybody knows Dr. John Rogers uh, is a leap year baby. So he gets a birthday every four years. And uh, it had to have been in 2000 because that's when I was in middle school. Sorry to age myself and some of you. Um, but I'll never forget one of the things we did was we, we were all brought downstairs to shake Dr. Rogers' hand on his birthday. And I remember thinking to myself at the time being 12 and my dad had just sort of started getting involved that, uh, wow, it's pretty cool. This guy's got a school named after him. And, um, and it was you know, partially what inspired me. Um, and then to, to echo everything that everyone has said about, about uh, Mr. Phelps, uh, I was on that first building committee with him um, and to the same sentiments Dan expressed, uh, a lot of what I learned about being on committees and serving Rockland and being a part of this community um, started first obviously when I met Dr. Rogers that day but a lot of it came through starting as an 18 year old kid on the middle school building committee uh, with with Dick Phelps and I, I wholeheartedly support this I think it's a wonderful tribute to him to his wife uh, and to the family as a whole anyone else 
So if no one else, I will uh, take a second on the uh, original motion. Okay. Uh, second. You got a second? second. We're all going to second it. <laughs> you got a second. All right. So uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Julie. Yes. Alan. Yes. Mark. Yes. Christine. Yes. Tim. An enthusiastic yes. Uh, Ashley? Yes. Jill? Absolutely yes. Jean? Yes. Doug? Yes. Bika? Yes. Dan? Yes, and thank you. Jared? Yes. Danielle? Absolutely yes. And I am a yes for uh, unanimous to, uh, to name the school uh, after uh, Richard and Ann Phelps. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, that's cool. Uh, thank you uh, very much, everybody. Um, and I, to Dan's point, I think this, I think it is earlier than what I think we had wanted it to be, but the circumstances um, <laughs> in this crazy ass world today um, has kind of, uh, I, I think waiting um, could have done a, could have done a disservice. We don't want that to happen. So uh, the last is invoice review. Um, you know, as you know, the, the invoices are all being vetted, um, and Alan has uh, uh, the authority to uh, to sign on our behalf. Uh, we haven't had any issues with that, but we also want to be as transparent as uh, as possible. So, here is the most recent. Thank you, Sean. Uh, invoice. Does anyone have any questions regarding the invoice at all? Just, just a note. Go ahead, Sean. Sorry. John, you muted. You had one one red red box around the bottom of the there page. What was that about? How's that? Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear. Uh, you. So our invoice sheet um, is shows all the invoices for every month. We'll, you'll have this to review, and then as part of this attachment, in case you want to dig into it, uh, we have attached. Um, a uh, su budget su summary sheet, a detailed budget sheet, and also a, a cash flow, and we'll do that every month, so people can uh, play along with the uh, how the how the cash is being spent on on this project. Sean, thank you for working with Biz on getting oh, her. Sure, she's been great. Yep, thank you. We like happy accountants. <laughs> and anything she needs, uh, I'll be ha if I can figure it out, I'm happy to accommodate her. It certainly makes life easier. Yeah, the I think on all this stuff, the, the, the whole process that is put in place is actually going to be beneficial because everyone at the committee is going to see what the invoices are. We have a second set of eyes in the town accountant looking at everything we do every month. And it just it's going to make for a smooth process, particularly with the MSBA and the uh, reimbursement from them. The, um, the process that we learned from best practices through the first project that when we came out the gate, we stumbled a little bit. And uh, fortunately, I think we learned from the first one and implemented this from day one. So I think it's a great process. Yeah, she's really, she's really helping us just walk through it and keeping us on track. The, um, okay. only, the only question I have which is more just functional and maybe just for my own curiosity and i don't know if jane or sean will answer it is this money still coming out of uh feasibility or have we spent that portion of the project budget uh, it's, feasibility is done and we are into construction documents now okay and was there any money left over in feasibility uh, i will check but typically what we do is we'll transfer that money down into the other um into the other buckets so that it becomes okay. eligible but it looks Perfect. like above, if there was it was minimal it's about seven thousand dollars yeah 
seven thousand dollars can buy some stuff though <laughs> absolutely it, it won't it, yeah if, it, if it's still up there it won't be msba reimbursable but it's still within your budget so uh it's it's certainly there to be spent if you need it right and if you remember at the end we had a what was it an extra twenty one thousand dollars that uh uh wasn't it towards the end that we we had an expense that we weren't uh, expecting during the feasibility study if i remember yeah there you know all of these are estimates so we do our best to keep um to keep underestimate and we did transfer some money down but the way the msba process works is we kind of have to take our uh our best guess at where we're going to end up and i think where we ended up with was with seven thousand dollars left in the um opm feasibility study budget but you know just because you're not getting reimbursed you gotta remember it's money that you didn't pay so you shouldn't be reimbursed for it anyway so you're saving a hundred percent of every dollar there Uh, does anyone have any questions? All right, if not, next is uh, next steps. Um, so our next steps are at the end of this month, uh, or actually early July, the architects uh, will have completed their 60% uh, drawing set. We're gonna send them off to the estimators. Uh, they will have them for three weeks. We'll do our estimate reconciliation, just like we did for the DD process, and we will submit that to the MSBA for their review. All right, does anyone have any questions on that? Uh, so Sean and, and Lorraine, just, just I, I wanna put it out. Uh, as far as schedule, uh, and, and I, uh, I kind of know the answer, but I wanted to ask the question, how are we in related to the schedule that was laid out um, to go through the design process? We're still uh, on schedule. Yep, we're, we are right on where we need to be. And, um, I, you know, we, I talk to Lorraine and her team frequently about making sure, you know, when we have milestone dates coming up that they're going to hit them and all indications are that we are hitting the dates that we need to hit. And I would like to just give a moment of kudos to my team if I can, because we are all working remotely. And architecture and engineering is not one of those professions that you typically do on your own. There's a ton of collaboration, a ton of sitting down together and analyzing you know how services are brought through the building and um, our team have just done a stellar job we have we use microsoft teams and um, i don't know how many times a day mariana will jump on a team's call and we'll screen share and figure out how to move a pipe and clear some structure and not have conflicts and you know we i do miss that in-person collaboration that our team is doing but um, we have not missed a deadline, uh, an internal deadline that we've set for ourselves uh, or an external deadline that we have set with the OPM on this or any of our projects. So um, I just want to give a little shout out to my team for an excellent job. And I'll, I, I'll echo you, Lorraine, mostly based on the importance of keeping, keeping the schedule. Um, I think what you guys have been doing um, Truly has been fantastic because ultimately is if the schedule starts to get into flux or, or we fall sort of off the rails, it's just going to end up costing us money. And uh, your, your guys uh, commitment to keeping us on track and keeping the project moving uh, on track through this is, is definitely commendable because that means we have more funds to spend on the things we need for this school. So I, I, I appreciate it as well. And, and just like all of you, they, you know, many of them have young children at home and we're all learning how to balance our profession as well as parenting and teaching, which is a new profession for us. So. You all have been good. You guys have been fantastic to work with, at least from my end. You guys have been great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jared. And so no, just, just, just to that point, I know that there's been a lot of questions and a lot of emails and a lot of um, back and forth. And I know Alan's really stepped in to help out with that process, but and, and a lot of other people on this team, not, but um, I think Alan's kind of the, the leader of the ship on the school side. And so that's certainly appreciative. And just so you know, that that is so important for us to keep on track when the architects ask a question, just responding to them and getting an answer timely is, is the way that they can keep on track and not having to go back and ask more questions. And that process is, has been great. So uh, we appreciate that for sure. And if you can continue that, um, that's gonna be about the most helpful thing anyone can do is when someone asks a question, try to jump on it and get a response. That way it gets into the drawings. It's not forgotten. It's not, it's not missed. You get what you want in the school and uh, it, it, it does help uh, our team continue. So I did want to add, um, and I think everyone has done a, a commendable job, everyone on the committee, um, our OPMs, our architects, uh, but I do want to call out two individuals 
Uh, one is Alan Cron and one is Doug Lapp. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, and I don't mean to slight anyone else, but they both have taken on um, a big portion of this project. Uh, and, and I don't know if everyone understands how much work that the two of them uh, in particular have been doing uh, behind the scenes. Um, you know, from just all kinds of things in the project. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a difficult um, scenario, uh, kind of talking about, you know, working remote, everyone works remote. So I think it adds uh, complexities and, and difficulty to, uh, to this whole project. And uh, the two of them have, uh, have really stepped up. So I want to, I want to acknowledge both of them and say thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, um, we will- You're on mute, Alan. Um, so with that, I, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have our next meeting. Um, and it looks like the, uh, the remote meetings will, uh, will continue for the foreseeable future. We don't know exactly when, uh, when and if this will ever end. Um, so we're looking at, I believe, July 23rd as our next meeting date. Uh, I'm sorry, July 16th, I think it is, right? Yes. So yes, the 16th. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll look to have our next meeting on July 16th, uh, and you know as it gets a little closer, we'll we'll send it out. Um, if things change and we can do a uh, a live meeting, we will do that. Um, I just don't know if that will be the case, and if we can't, then we'll do another remote. All right. Uh, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Rich, before we motion, can we have oh. Alan finish what he was going to say? Yes. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't want to make a long meeting longer, but um, I may look. I may look young, um, but I've been through four of these building projects over the years, and I have never worked with an architect and an OPM that are as professional as you guys. So I am truly grateful and have never regretted for a moment our decision to go with both of you. And I thank Mark Sham for his guidance on that. Um, this is going to be a tremendous project. Every time I see the work that you're doing, I'm just thrilled for the, for the kids of Rockland. So um, thank you very much. And, and Rich, I think you're doing a hell of a job as chair, too, since we're handing out compliments. That's all I have. Yeah, I'm just turning all the things to you and Doug. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. I might look dumb. I'm not dumb. No. <laughs> all right. So I will now take a motion. A motion to adjourn. I got a second. motion. Uh, I got a second from Jared, and we'll we'll take the. Uh, so Julie. Yes. Alan. Yes. Uh, Mark. Yes. Christine. Yes. Tim. Yes. Ashley. Yes. Jill. Yes. Jane. Yes. Doug. Yes. Chris? Yes. Dan? Yes. Jared? Yes. Is Danielle still on? I don't think so. I think she had to go get the kids. Okay. All right. And I'm a yes. So uh, we are meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you.